typically when we see a particular reaction we can come up with a prediction if that particular reaction is spontaneous and one of the most common questions that you'll see on standardized exams are something like here's a particular reaction so the reaction that we're going to analyze first is something that's of big importance in industry and if you look in previous chapters there's something called the Haber process and the Haber process was invented back around the World War I era and in World War I they needed ammonia and a way to make ammonia is to take nitrogen gas react it with three equivalents of hydrogen gas and this is going to form an equilibrium with two equivalents of ammonia all in the gas form if we analyze this particular reaction and we try to figure out when this is going to be spontaneous because in an industrial process we're not only interested in if a reaction is spontaneous we also have to keep in the back of our minds about everything we learned in kinetics because just because a reaction is spontaneous that doesn't mean it's going to happen at an appreciable speed so let's consider the following reaction which is part of the Haber process so we'll consider this reaction and we're going to say that this is exothermic and that the delta S naught for the reaction is going to be equal to negative 191 joule <coughs> per Kelvin so the question is can we predict something about the spontaneity of this reaction given the following information we know that delta G delta G naught is going to be equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught so here's our particular reaction and typically you might think well they didn't tell me the value for delta H so I can't figure this out the delta H here is going to be negative because we're told that this is an exothermic reaction so in an exothermic reaction we have a negative delta H and delta G is going to be equal to delta H naught minus T delta S naught if our particular reaction has a negative value for our delta S this second term right here is going to be positive so the spontaneity of this reaction is temperature dependent so the question is is this spontaneous at high temperatures is it spontaneous at low temperatures if we have a negative value for delta H we're off to a good start if you read back in chapter 5 of the textbook it will say stuff like most exothermic reactions are spontaneous because if we look at these terms the delta H is typically expressed in kilojoules the delta S is in joules and if we have a negative value for that delta H we can get or we can dictate the spontaneity of the reaction but it's not the entire piece of the puzzle so here we have minus T delta S our delta S is negative so this term becomes positive so this is telling us that high temperatures this reaction is not going to be spontaneous so that means the spontaneity of this reaction is temperature dependent and we're going to find that this particular reaction is spontaneous at low temperatures <coughs> 
And this is great for us because we can say that if we want an industrial process, we want this particular reaction to be spontaneous, and we want it to be spontaneous at room temperature if we can. But oftentimes you're going to find that in industrial reactions, they use big furnaces and fires to help these reactions proceed. Because what this equation right here is telling us that, and I should probably write this down here, under standard conditions, this reaction is spontaneous at low temperatures. But what happens if we take a particular chemical reaction and we analyze it under non-standard conditions? And if we do so, we get an equation that says delta G is going to be equal to delta G naught plus RT ln Q. So in this particular reaction, delta G naught is the standard Gibbs free energy. Under any other conditions, we can manipulate that delta G. Particularly in this case, we have the reaction quotient Q. Q for our reaction that we have is going to be either the concentrations of the products divided by the <laughs> concentrations of the reactants. Or for this particular example, it's more appropriate to say the partial pressures of the products divided by the partial pressures of the reactants. So here we're going to have the partial pressure of NH3, and that quantity needs to be squared. That's going to be divided by the partial pressure of nitrogen times the partial pressure of hydrogen, that quantity to the third power. So by manipulating this Q right here, or this product that we have from the partial pressures of our gases, we can manipulate which way an equilibrium would shift. Le Chatelier observed this first, and he said if you have an equilibrium and you provide a stress on that particular equilibrium, you can shift it one way or the other. If we want to favor the products, we need to increase the partial pressure of nitrogen and hydrogen. So it should be kind of common sense to us that if we want to make ammonia, if we have more nitrogen and hydrogen around and increase those pressures, we're going to get more of a yield or more of a product. So if you're thinking like an industrial chemist and you want to try to figure out how to increase your yield, you can manipulate these pressures right here. Just as an aside, and I'll show this over here um, in this space, if we were going to graph the natural log of x, think about what that graph would be, and think about where it's going to be positive and negative. If I asked everyone what the natural log of 1 was, I would hope they would say 0. So if we say that this point on the graph right here is where x is equal to 1, that's where y is going to equal 0. So our graph is going to look something like this. The thing that I will emphasize here is when x is less than 0, the natural log of x is going to have a negative number. Where x is greater than 0, the natural log of x is going to be positive. This is something that's very key for us when we're looking at spontaneity. Because for a reaction to be spontaneous, our delta G needs to be negative. So if we're trying to manipulate this particular expression, and we're looking at the natural log of Q, if we wanted to make it negative, we need to make that value as small as we can. In order to do that, if we want a small Q, we can do one of three things. We can decrease the partial pressure of NH3, or we could increase the partial pressure of nitrogen, <coughs> 
and we can also increase the partial pressure of the hydrogen. All three of these effects are going to influence the natural log of Q, which will also influence what our overall delta G is going to be. So here's our, our particular reaction. There's a couple, one other thing that we can do with this particular equation. If we're at equilibrium, we know a couple things. So if our system is at equilibrium, we know that Q is going to be equal to K, and that our delta G is going to equal 0. So that means that 0 is going to equal delta G naught plus RT ln of K. If we rearrange this expression, we can say that delta G naught is going to be equal to minus RT ln K at equilibrium. So this expression right here is very important, as well as this expression right here. Let's think about the consequences of this particular expression and how that relates to our equilibrium constants. This K can be anything. It can be a KSP, it can be a KP, it can be a KC. We're going to find in the later chap sections of this book, it could be what we call a KTH or a thermodynamic K. It can be a KA, it can be a KB. But let's think about what we talked about earlier this quarter. If I have a KSP of, let's say, silver chloride, that KSP is 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10. Think about what the magnitude of K tells us about that particular reaction. It's telling us that that equilibrium is going to favor all the reactants. Another way of saying that is that this reaction does not really proceed forward very well. Now let's talk about what that means in terms of when we're looking at a delta G naught. A delta G naught, if the reaction doesn't proceed, we could think, hey, that's going to be a positive value. If we have 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10, and we come back up here to our graph of the natural log of x, 1.8 times 10 to the minus 10 is going to be a value less than 1. So it's going to be a negative value for the natural log of x. If your natural log of x is negative, then minus RT ln k is going to be positive, indicating that that reaction is not going to go forward very well, which would indicate that it's not a spontaneous process. And what we find with all these equations when we talk about thermodynamic quantities is that these are giving us validation, or a proof, I guess you could say, of what Le Chatelier studied with his equilibrium expressions. So it's kind of like a further validation for what we've seen from experimental details before. So these are two very, very key equations that you're going to have to be able to manipulate. And the great thing about these equations, or in some instances, the brutal thing about these, is we can use these for any type of process. And we can then figure out how much of a pressure we have at equilibrium. What happens as we proceed? What is the percent of gases that decompose over a certain time period? So we can use these things to tie together kinetics and thermodynamics, and you're going to see that. And you might need to review a little bit of chapter 15 when you do the Mastering Chemistry quiz, because we can start tying these concepts together.